The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into care and living with Mercer has actually worked in asset management in the UK, but in recent times has become passionate about elder care in our society and I discovered was at Club Mac, I mean Macquarie University, many years ago when I was there too, uh, surviving actuarial studies. So thank you so much for joining me on the show. Will Beckett. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thank you. I survived <laughs> so that was Macquarie a Uni as well. Right. That was a long time ago. <laughs> wow. I, I think been... I only did one subject of actuarial studies and then I fell back to economics instead. Probably mathematics of finance. <laughs> that was that entry level one, wasn't it? 101. Yeah. Oof. Oof. Rough. I'm, I'm, yeah. There's some PTSD about all of that for me. <laughs> it was yeah. very tough. All righty. I'm keen to pick your brain about all things elder care and what you guys at Mercer are doing. But first, let's take a moment to get to know you a little better through your use of technology. What's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I definitely use emojis. Um, I It's not dog paws, although dog paws would come pretty close. It's probably being grateful, okay. actually. So the grateful hands nice. and I've uh, been mindful of that. Oh, lovely. Well, that's a nice friendly one. I like yeah. You know what? We may not have had that before on the show. So well done for bringing a bit of, of care and humanity onto the show. Thank you. <laughs> um, if you then had to delete, I mean, we, we all live with our smartphones all the time, don't we? If you had to delete everything off them and just have three apps on your smartphone, which ones would you keep? Yeah. Okay. Um, definitely banking. I love online banking. Uh, mm-hmm. Secondly, it would have to be Spotify. I couldn't do without my music. Uh, Sam Cook Sundays, for example. Nice. Uh, and then thirdly, it would be maps. I love travel, um, looking overseas and dreaming about the next trip. Me too. I have actually, we love watching um, all the travel things and even the foodie things on the TV. And the whole time I have my phone ready to tag a place in maps. And Nick's like, what are you looking at? I'm like, I'm, that place in Croatia, that place in <laughs> Finland. He's like, literally the restaurant. Yep. I'm yep. tagging it, <laughs> ready for when we eventually get there. So I'm right there with you. I love it. All right, let's dive into Care and Living with Mercer. So this is a little different, folks. So this is a, yes, it's an online service and it, and you'll end up having your own URL. But just to give us a sense of of what we're talking about here, how did it come about? Where did this all start um, for you, but also for the business in terms of focusing on el- elder care and services that can help? I um, I started on this journey about eight years ago, and actually I was a gatekeeper for investments and product supporting advisors yep. um, within large wealth management businesses. And it was during that time uh, I read a core data survey that asked three questions. Uh, and the first was, uh, do you find aging um, care or back then aged care complex? And 80% of respondents said yes. Yeah. Um, would you like support for your aged care arrangements? And 80% said yes. 
And then the third question was really illuminating for me. It um, it said, so where do you go for support or where would you go for support? And uh, the top one was the local aged care provider who was okay. really well-meaning but hopelessly conflicted. Yeah. Uh, you know, a residential aged care home uh, just around the corner is not going to say, well, actually, we think you are better at staying at home with care, so don't come right. to us or go to the provider down the road. Yeah. Second is the government's My Aged Care website, which – uh, has been regularly called out as being pretty substandard and okay. very difficult to navigate. Yep. And then third is family and friends. And daylight, daylight to advisors, employers, super funds. There's back then there was nothing available um, okay. that for people. And so that set me on this journey. I knew nothing about aged care industry or anyone. And through LinkedIn, there you go, a bit of yep, bit of um, tech and. Uh, digital, I just built my network and my knowledge and a business case, which led to care and living with Mercer. Yep. So, And um, so, um, look, it's so interesting because there's a lot more talk about this. And we were saying actually before we hit record that it's not a new thing, right? That there's a need for understanding and, and insights and information for that stage of life. Uh, however, approaching it in a structured or proactive way rather than it being reactive is probably the newest part, right? It's something that I guess historically, you know, somebody um, or their family reach a point where they're going to have to do something and then we react and we just sort of act in the moment. Um, whereas uh, what I really like about um, what you guys are trying to do is is let's start talking about it, preparing it for it and doing the digging well ahead of when you're going to need it, which, look, that's always going to be a better option, right? This is just the pain, suffering, and 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 emotion that this can sort of save people from has got to be extreme. You must have seen that in the in the cases you guys have assisted with. Yeah, we hear it all the time, uh, and it starts with uh, a person being on the phone with one of our care consultants, and often they're in tears uh, and grateful because they just didn't know where to start, uh, yeah. let alone work their way through the putting new arrangements in place. It is highly emotional um, because of its complexity. It takes so much time and it's very difficult to make decisions that you have confidence in, um, mm. both because of the health outcomes, but also the financial outcomes as well. Yeah. If you if you make a mistake, it's bloody expensive. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the I guess the, the impact is enormous in this space and it is – Pretty amazing, as you said, that it, it has been around for a long time, <laughs> and our service is the only one of its kind in, in yeah. Australia, which which too is surprising. And I guess I reflect that it's probably because the demographics um, has now probably reached a tipping point where baby boomers have been reaching sixty five for ten years now, yeah. and uh, whilst it's been this slow moving sort of locomotive coming at us. Many people have just ignored it, uh, but I think we're at that tipping point where it, it actually does impact a, a vast majority of uh, financial advisors' clients now. It's 70%, 80% of your client base and actually probably 90 95% of your client base's assets that are yes. impacted by this. Absolutely. And and. You know, it, it does fall into one of those topics, and I'm um, happy to be um, open in this sense from my own perspective as an advisor of of it feels like the biggest can of worms of all time. Like it does feel like a topic that, like, do I need four degrees to be able to even, you know, have a conversation about, like there's a hesitation there about wanting to do it well and then knowing that this is a huge thing, you you topic you're embarking on, and therefore there's a lot of hesitation. Like I just think it's natural because we want to do the right thing. This is not avoidance because we want to not help the client. It's almost like, oh, that feels huge. Yeah. And so I'm interested. To, so I'm guessing that you guys started very much focused to the end consumer or the end, you know, the end client um, and the solution started that way. And then clearly it's evolved into something where you're partnering with advisors um, to sort of assist. Can you talk me through how that came about? Oh, I'd love to. Um, <laughs> it's it's interesting, uh, but your guess is wrong. Oh, so really? whilst that core data survey uh, was aimed at the end consumer, uh, I was also influenced at the time uh, by reading the Edelman um, Trust Barometer, 
and yeah. of, of, of institutions. And it really got me exploring who are the key institutions, so to speak, in people's lives. Um, so rather than a direct consumer model, yeah, um, I set about in creating this service, but then also working with financial advisors, with super funds, with um, employers. Employers, yeah, okay. Um, and these communities that, as individuals, that we spend so much time um, and importance uh, connected with. So why can't they help for also aging care needs um, yeah. as well? And so, so that's our model. We um, we fit perfectly with financial advisors um, because uh, so Calm or Care and Living with Mercer Calm, uh, it's an advice service uh, for aging care. Uh, for an Australian or adult child supporting an Australian. Yeah. And it covers anything from living at home with care through to um, retirement living, retirement village, residential aged care, or even end of life preparation. Yeah. And uh, when you think about a person's second half of life, from mid 60s through to a hypothetical 100, that's 35 years. <laughs> and during that 35 years, they can have three to five key moments where they need new or evolved aging care needs. Yeah. And it may start in the late 60s or early 70s with a bit of support at home. And that may then morph into moving out of the big family home and into a retirement village or or uh, um, a smaller place without stairs, for example. And then it morphs into maybe a home care package that yeah. starts on a low means um, or evolves to high means, or, or moving into residential aged care and ultimately end of life. Every single one of those three to five key moments is tough. Mm. What we were talking about before, the emotion involved, the um, the difficulty in making decisions with confidence, the financial aspects. And therein lies the opportunity for advisors, uh, because as you said, most advisors don't ask their clients, be they clients who are 65 years and over and probably more directly having the need, yeah. or um, their adult children who may be <laughs> 40 to 65. Yeah. Advisors don't ask because of, I think, two reasons. One, um, there's just so much to know as an advisor that to then add aging care into yeah. your knowledge base um, is just too difficult. There's just too much to take on. So yeah. to be that subject matter expert is very tough. Secondly, I think advisors find it difficult to monetize their time in this space yeah. as well. And so most advisors don't ask uh, a client who's 50, you know, do you have parents who have aging care needs or a client who's 65, do you have aging care needs for yourself? Because they don't want to ha ha get the answer yes back. Yeah. <laughs> and so what CALM does is um, we're non-financial. We're 80% of the problem for people. Right. And that's understanding the system. What are the options? How do you work through putting arrangements in place? Um, and at the right time through that new arrangement process, we will work hand in glove with the advisor who then provides the financial advice, be it cash flow modeling and 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 assets and so on for Centrelink and so on. Um, yeah. So we're perfectly complementary for advisors, but it allows the advisor to then ask, okay, so you know, do you have aging care needs or do your parents or grandparents have aging care needs? And if they get a yes back, then they say, okay, well, let me introduce you to Care and Living with Mercer mm. um, for a very cheap, transparent cost. Uh, and the advisor is generating new advice opportunities because with each one of those, the client is going to need that cash flow and, and asset um, financial advice, which yeah. arguably the advisor wasn't capturing those opportunities in the past. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think... Um, you know, if, if any of the listeners out there um, haven't witnessed up close this process, then, you know, in – and I can, of course, only speak to, you know, being – you know, my friends and I being the adult children of somebody that's going through that age range – it might be all consuming for the person going through it, but I can tell you it's all consuming for their adult kids too. Like this is not a – this is not something on the side. You know, this is – this can be every waking moment that you're not working, you are trying to address, having conversations about dealing with, trying to fit in a call to this. Like it's a 
it is is a very difficult um, challenge. And so, as advisors, what what I like about this is, as advisors, if we've got other things we're trying to get those adult adult kids to pay attention to. If we don't have a way to help with this, then there's going to be a period where we can't get their attention at all, to be quite frank, because naturally they're just caught up. Like it's just, it really is all consuming. So I think, you know, I love the idea of having confidence about a place that you can send them to who do this all the time. And, you know, that, that repetition is really valuable. I think people would really, oh, thank goodness, this is somebody who will have seen somebody go through this. Absolutely. Like I think, you know, that is um, so important and uh, impartial, you know, somebody impartial. They, they're they not going to worry about, you know, what what your mum thinks about this or what that, like all of those dynamics, they're going to worry because they want to help, but not because they have any skin in the game, right? There's no, there's no um, bias to them, which is I think really helpful in this situation, uh, is to have like something like you guys where you can look, we're just going to help find you find the right solution for this situation. So absolutely. You know, I think and, that's and powerful. Because I, uh, because I came from your world, I all, another principle that we have for calm is that we're completely independent. We take no commissions from, um, any referrals. Right. Uh, and if there's a, a successful arrangement with, um, with an aged care provider, we don't get any commission or payback. Um, yeah. Where there's some other models out there for care concierge that typically do have that uh, commission-based model, mm-hmm. uh, but um, it does lead to conflicts and should be banned. Um, yeah. But the aged care industry's got so many issues at the moment; they haven't quite got to the conflict uh, and independence one yet. But yeah. Calm is completely independent. And I think the other thing that's interesting about it, and this where the, this is where the tech starts, folks. So, so what I like too is instead of the first step being um, interfacing with a human being, whether it's on the phone or whatever it is, which is confronting for anybody, even the adult kids, like oh, we're going to have an appointment to talk about whatever, is giving them the opportunity to fill in some information online and get a report that's going to give them and even almost like a, it's almost like a program designed for them to step through the understanding of what they need to learn and, and how all this works. It's a lovely, non-invasive, lets them passively start this journey without being too confrontational. So I think that's a clever way to start for, you know, providing assistance so that they can build a bit of conference before even they bring it up with mum and dad. You know, they'll have some, they'll be armored with information. We are all about trying to make something very complex as simple as possible, uh, particularly if it's, if it's actually a 65 year old uh, or older um, who is the client. Yep. Uh, because often they are less tech savvy and yep. um, trying to follow the aged care system is incredibly complex. So um, the, the, Digital tool is so critical in in that simplification, um, but also it allows us to personalize the experience. So we can provide a plan with actions specific to uh, the person or the family's Mm -hmm. circumstances. And then um, it is human-led. So we have care consultants who are, say, occupational therapists trained as aging care experts uh, but they're behind the scenes. And so if the client asks for a, a review of their plan by answering a few questions around their preferences, aging preferences, which could be location-based but also cultural or language-based, um, right. for example, um, or diversity-based, we'll add new actions into their plan. Um, and so from a technological perspective, they can go into their roadmap at any time of day. They can share it with their family, so it's a true family solution as well. So that um, that 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 website, that tool, is critical uh, to allow the family to use it at the time and the manner they want to. But it also helps us keep the cost low as yeah. well. That cost to serve, and yeah. um, and it's critical that people who can't afford. Five, six, seven thousand dollars a year um, have have these roadmaps for a very, very cheap uh, price. So let's sort of step through that. We'll step through it from the um, 
the end sort of client or consumer first, and then we can talk about what that means for the practice. But so the, and whether it's the individual themselves or their kids can um, go to a landing page, fill in some details. That initial detail actually is quite spare, isn't it? For that first initial sort of draft outline, it's just a handful of things. Three um, questions. Three yep. questions, right. So we get that early stage and then um, they get some, you know, initial response that's sort of some information and then it sort of can dive into some more layered questions. What's interesting to me about the roadmap you're talking about, which is almost the output of that, is it's really granular. Like it's, <laughs> this is not, gee, in the best world for the whole of Australia, this might be the general way you approach this. Like this is not what you guys have come up with. It's it's down to postcode level, hey, where you're saying you want to be, these are the things that might be possible once your care consultants have had the opportunity to to do that digging and refine it. Is that correct? Have I described that? Absolutely, yep. So, yeah. so we will be able to uh, provide three referrals for a home care service or residential aged care or retirement village in regional Victoria who may have Italian-speaking carers, for example, uh, or dementia ward. Uh, And our care consultants will also be able to check whether there's accessibility. And so by that, I mean um, not from a, a disability perspective, but more the workforce in aged care at the moment uh, is is very short. And Mm. so providers may say they support a certain city or town, regional centre, but actually they don't because they don't have the workers. And so as, as advocates for your clients, uh, we check on that and that um, forms part of our referral service. And we can, so so we can cover anywhere in Australia um, with this model. So, so what's interesting is in terms of what you've then, even those steps. So that's before they, so they, the client hasn't spoken to any me- member of your team at that point. They've answered some questions. The team of um, the machine has come up with a response. The team have then tailored a bit with a bit of digging. They haven't spoken to a human. However, they now have. I mean, the hours saved for the client in digging. I, I mean, I, do you guys have a sense of that? Do you have any feel for how much time you may have saved someone to even just get them to that point? Uh, we feel it's already fifty percent um, of the time required. To that point, uh, they still yeah. need to work through the process and, and yeah. the actions, but we've already saved fifty percent of the time. Uh, but it's it's probably it's time, and many people just drop out and don't do anything because they're like um, you know deer in the headlights, yeah. and they don't know where to start. Yeah. So it's also just helping people have the confidence to step through the door and start that journey as well. Yeah. And the sooner you do it, the better, because if you don't. Um, whether it's for yourself, a partner, or parents, it ha- it can have some real outcomes uh, around um, at at worst death or, yeah. or health deterioration or monetary um, impact. And I do, and well, I completely agree. And I and I, you know, having had these conversations and had it with friends where we're talking through, gee, we're struggling to have these conversations. You know, say with their parents due to all sorts of reasons. Um, having this information can circumvent because the individual is doubting a lot too. They're uncertain and they don't know what's going on and and unsure. If you can at least um, respond that, oh yes, this is possible, and hey, they have like you say Italian speaking. Oh, um, you know, so it it can take away a whole lot of that fear, so that then you can get down to the real fear, which can be a whole lot of other things as well, right? So it lets you um, demonstrate, I think, for a family member, a great deal of care of understanding and, and hey, we've managed to get this far and now let's just talk about this. And we're not in a hurry. We've thought of it ahead of time. We're just going to give you time to think it through. But you know what? We've managed to knock off a whole lot of this thinking. So I, I think there's – um I think it could be really empowering for families to be able to go on this journey um, well ahead of time and – and let them feel like they are contributing. I think that's the other challenge is sometimes it just feels like you're banging your head against a brick wall trying to dig this stuff out, right? It's frustrating and and you can feel a bit stupid. Like, like why can't I work this out? Like, it seems like this should be obvious, but it's just, you know, yeah. I'm not getting anywhere. So, you know, to feel good about the contribution you're making, um, I think is really powerful. So they've got their, their personalized roadmap. Um, that gives them a link that then they can be sharing with maybe their other siblings, if it's their adult kids yep. or their partner, if it's somebody going through it. So that's that step. Um, then, of course, they can chat to somebody if they've got questions. Is that correct? They can. They can. And um, 
they may not even know the right pathway at the start before they create a roadmap. So they can chat to um, e- either on the phone or book a meeting. Okay. Um, and, and the meeting is often used, interestingly, by adult children who may book a week in advance and they have mum and dad with them on the zoo. Yeah. Um, so it can be a family affair then. Uh, but um, once a roadmap's run or a particular action within a roadmap, the person and family can contact our care consultants to talk through the whole plan in its entirety or a particular aspect of that. And it may be, uh, you know, they're, they're up to the stage where they have to engage my age care for an assessment for a home care package. And, right. you know, what questions am I going to get? What exactly am I asking for? How do I avoid errors that's going to add months to this process, for example? Or importantly, we don't just cover the task and the process aspects, but we also support people for the emotional behavioral aspects. Okay. And um, a, a classic example that I'll give you is helping an adult child who has concerns about uh, mum or dad's deterioration, but yep. mum and dad are, or mum, let's say mum, fiercely independent, really yep. wants to maintain her dignity and yes. has uh, a big case of aging denial. Yes, doesn't want to hear anything from um, her uh, daughter or, or son. And so we help um, how to have that conversation, when to have that conversation. And so these behavioral aspects are just as important. And, and I know that uh, and for advisors, it's exactly the same for you yes. when you're working with clients. It's not just about task and process, is it? No, no, not at all. And in fact, we can be, you can be as right as you like. You can you can have a hundred percent hit rate on answering the correct and coming up with the perfect advice and do all those things, but if you can't handle the behavioural elements, none of that stuff gets implemented. I mean, we've all learned that the hard way, right? It's it's all about the behavioural. And if we're it's it's so interesting because if we're really honest with ourselves, most of us are resisting what aging means. Most of us are. Now, it's not that's not vanity. That's just. No, surely not. I mean, I feel like our brains lag a, a good 10 to 15 years in terms of acknowledging the age we are. It's like our birthdays are a surprise every year. Like, really? Is that my age? You know, I, mean, I think just that's a perfectly normal response. So if you project that forward, then it's natural that, you know, our, our parents um, and our elders are, are feeling the same way. It's the same experience. It's just, you know, a bit further along. Um, and, the other thing I think that we need to acknowledge is, you know, they potentially witnessed with their parents or their grandparents. We don't know what they've witnessed of the way people have handled it or or were cared for or not cared for. So, you know, there's a lot of history and imprinting about this stuff that's gone on um, that can be part of why they're resistant, you know, or no, it's why so they true. don't want, uh, right? take, Taking that into account. And it was a pretty bad experience, almost certainly, for past generations. And yes. there's a lot of focus on aging care now, and it's getting better into the future. And, and so the experience will be better. But that imprint that you talk about of what happened in the past, it's pretty horrific for most people. It and is. They just it don't is. want to face and, into and- it. You know, a blind. You know, they, they, that is not going to happen to me. You know, like I'm not letting that happen. Um, and fair enough. Um, but unfortunately, we need tools to help us handle those conversations because sometimes that can put them in a worse position. You know, that resistance can actually mean that they're not taking proactive steps that could help them out. That actually could make them more active and and more you know full of life than they otherwise would be. So it's and, you're and right. That's the irony of this. Yeah. Um, if <laughs> If we accept support uh, earlier, it's it's not about, I don't know, being incompetent to look after no. yourself and losing that independence. It's actually enabling you to go and live a great quality of life um, yeah. with a little bit of extra support. And so yeah. that's the ironic situation Isn't that we it? face. It so is. So that sort of um, your feedback, speaking to one of the um, care consultants they have, that's all part of that fixed dollar fee, isn't it? So it's sort of, yeah. this is what you get. You get the roadmap and then you get this person that you can um, sort of get feedback on or clarify things or or get that, you know, bit of initial assistance. So, but there's also then another level um, of service and an interesting um example that I remember your team mentioned was, you know, you might um, 
you you know, might you know the client's kids might be overseas or or you know there can be all, all sorts of reasons that we're separated from the people we're trying to care for um, in distance. And so, talk me through that level of service where you guys sort of can take take on an, a more active role. So the the service we've talked about so far is our guidance and advice service uh, yep. with the the digital portal and roadmaps and and unlimited access to care consultants. Uh, but we um, still ask for the uh, the client to carry out the action. So yep. we'll recommend three home care providers. But you've still got to, uh, a- including contact details uh, of those providers, but you still have to interview the providers, decide which one you want, um, and, and you can sense check that with our consultants. If you're uh, emotionally overwhelmed or time poor, um, and you really need to finish the process as quickly as possible uh, or uh, just your well-being uh, in support or obviously your parents, mm. then you can engage our care cons- concierge service. And that's where we do as much of the activities with you as we can. And that's okay. the really high-touch service. Um, and um, that's where, say, a plan and placement, we will conduct a care needs assessment uh, with a care plan that we agree, and then that care plan allows us to um, propose a number of providers, uh, go and organise interviews or tours of the providers, actually conduct those with you, uh, help with decision making, and then putting, um, you know, making the move. Um, and we also then check in for a month or two afterwards to make sure that um, it's gone well. So that that uh, very high touch service. I think our record is about a month, uh, okay. so nothing's nothing's you know a, a week long. But yeah. that's that's starting from scratch for a residential aged care placement. Um, um, but typically, it'll take a couple of months. Now, if someone or a family were to try and do that by themselves, typically we would see that taking three months. But often, a person would have to either take time off or or even um, quit work to do that. But yeah. more typically, six to nine months. Uh, so yeah. the time, the well-being, uh, and the financial aspects are enormous, um, and, and more than pays for the uh, the fee for service of that care concierge. Yeah, and I think you know, there's because there's two levels of care here, isn't there? So there's certainly the individual going through it who who is looking for their next home or their like their next um, place that they're gonna gonna live and hopefully enjoy, but there's also the family who are going through that too. And that's a juggling act. And and you can often I'm well, you need to tell me, but I'm I'm betting that often there's a one of the family who ends up being sort of the primary one that's involved, just to, just because that's natural. That could, and it's different for every family, but there'll be one that's the one that's generally involved. And the weight of that responsibility, all of the activities, like you say, may have to take time off work, you know, all that sort of stuff can be heavy, you know, and, and that comes down to their well being then. Like this can really, really get people can get ill, all sorts of things. So to have a service that they well, okay, I can weigh up the cost of that and go, well, we can get all this great support and it may mean it doesn't drag on nearly as long either. Um, you know, wow. I, I'm betting there's yeah. a lot of people that are just, yeah, where do I sign? Like, please, please help. It is typically one person and most often it's a daughter. Mm-hmm. And if I had to get really granular, it's often the eldest daughter right. um, or daughter-in-law uh, yep. as well. Okay. Um, who takes on that sort of coordinator or the chief family officer role, right. uh, the CFO role. Yeah. But then um, siblings always have an opinion as of well. Course. And so they could lean in and, you know, create a bit of havoc and then step yep. away whilst the chief family officer is left there trying to coordinate it all for mum and or dad. Yeah. The other thing to consider with that well-being aspect is if, say, uh, dad needs, he's had a health issue and, and needs new arrangements, mum um, it's her well-being as well. She doesn't necessarily need to move somewhere right. or get care in, but she can't actually look after the, her partner properly herself, and yeah. it's extremely stress- stressful for her as well. So there's all these dynamics going on, and every individual, like every family, is different to um, to others. Yeah, absolutely. So, sort of that's the breadth of then the sort of end user for one of a better, I mean, that's our tech speak, right? Um, the yep. user experience. Uh, let's talk about then advisors that become sort of the partner um, with you guys. Then 
there's you talk me through that experience and the tools that you have available to sort of a both introduce a practice to this as a concept but also you know sort of make it a core element of what they provide we uh so we uh we have quite a few advisors as uh clients already and Mm -hmm. can suggest a number of models uh, for the advisor to consider. So it depends on their practice, yep. uh, their client base. And so some advisors really are using Calm as a revenue growth um, tool, opportunity, yep. uh, um, creating advice um, opportunities that they didn't have before. Uh, okay. So that's fantastic. Some are seeing it as a, a retention tool and just passing on um, the low cost without any markup. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so even some dealer groups are absorbing the cost uh, as well, but it's 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 rare and increasingly rare. <laughs> um, but typically, the model is for advisors to pass the cost on to client, but probably with a bit of a markup. Yep. Um, and also a new advice opportunity. Yep. Then how we help and work with the advisor is, is where does it fit within the client um, service model? Yes. How do you position this service relative to your other skill sets and, and services as well? Because for most advisors, this is a new variant or, mm. or an entirely new service. Mm. Um, the, the, if, if, I, if I leave one message for advisors who are listening, it is that this is not aged care. Right. I've tried very hard not to use the words aged care because uh, for us advisors, aged care – really refers to the last 18 months of someone's life as they're moving into residential aged care. Yeah. And advisors who are aged care specialists have traditionally really only provided funding advice into residential aged care. Right. I'm talking about a 35-year aging journey with those three to five key moments, uh, which are new advice opportunities um, through that journey. And so as, as, as we as professionals have been grappling with um, how do we – service someone through their retirement as well as we've serviced them through their accumulation years, mm-hmm. here is a key opportunity. So, um, you know, insurance, people don't take insurance after 65. This is a form of insurance um, as well as then um, supporting family in that intergenerational aspect as well. Yeah. So helping advisors, we help advisors think about how to position this within their service model for their client base. Um, of course, we have all of the, the content, whether they have their own website or emails um, or scripts when they're on the phone. Yep. Advisors can sit through doing a roadmap with their clients or, or give the link to the client to do on their own and come back. Yep. We also have one-to-one um, training and uh, contact center for advisors uh, okay. a- as well. Uh, so particularly with Jack, who actually came from my aged care contact center three years ago, and so mm-hmm. he's he's definitely moved moved beyond that um, to be a true calm calmite. Mm-hmm. Um, but we provide that one to one support for advisors um, as well as then the advisors' clients. We have webinars. Uh, we had the example of an advisor in Western Australia who. Um, invited to our last webinar, seventy of their clients and forty-five actually attended uh, wow. the webinar. And we were focused on what government support is available okay. um, across the spectrum, and so it's really resonating. And so, out of that, this advisor, uh, you know, he uh, generated at least ten new advice um, opportunities with existing clients that he wouldn't have had before. So, yeah. it's it's really up to each advisor and their practice as to how they position position it. Um, and we've got all of the content and expertise to support you. And in terms of then, um, you know, in partnership then, my understanding is, so the practice then gets its own unique version of the URL where they send clients in terms of, the, you know, getting a roadmap. So it's still it's still connected in terms of the client seeing it as part of your business in that, you know, in that sense, it's, it's sort of not seeing them off to <laughs> right off you go, do your thing. You know, it's sort of uh, can still be folded into what you're doing, which I think is powerful. Yep. So then I'm curious actually about, I mean, I know this is not thousands of practices you're in um, doing this just yet, but what do you see that the practices have done that's worked really well like who really nails this in terms of folding you into what they're doing for their clients 
It is the uh, it is the practice who does look uh, a little bit more holistically in terms of their support of clients, mm-hmm. but doesn't but but is happy to outsource parts of it. And and in in effect, that's uh, what advisors would be doing with Calm for that non financial aging journey aspects. Yeah. Uh, so so really, it's it's nothing. Um, it's not rocket science. Um, I think the the biggest blocker, if that's potentially where you'd lead next, is mm-hmm. advisors are busy um, and they've got well established procedures and and um, services. Mm-hmm. And taking a breather to think about a change to that service model and how to add this new uh, new service in um, is often the the blocker as well, but yeah, um, it is to the detriment of of revenue and better client support. And when you think about the aging demographics, it's um, you've got to ask yourself: Can I afford not to do this, rather than can I afford yeah. to do this? Yeah, and like you say, it's this is because this is a journey over time, like thirty five years. Then it's going to come up multiple times. Like this is because they're going to go through different stages. So, so I guess what I'm hearing is therefore they could reconnect again. So it could be that they've done one, they've paid for that one initial experience. It could be eight, ten years down the track, they're sort of entering another phase. Then they could revisit and speak to you know the calm consultant, yep. get that you know update the roadmap or change the roadmap roadmap based on where they're at. You know, like is that the way that you guys see this working? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, lifelong customers for sure, yeah. and and I guess this a, the I'm going to call it the spaghetti bowl of family networks as well. <laughs> and so if a if if a client's um, a husband and wife are clients, and they may have done something for the the husband's parents, next it could be uh, the wife's parents or grandparents. You just yeah. never know um, where a family is touched by this aging journey. And where the new opportunities come from, and so it's not just new opportunities with existing clients, but new clients as well, yeah, uh, come out of this. Fantastic. And then, is there any element you see that that um or or I mean, it, it's fairly clear from an advice practice that it's about you know sending people to the roadmap and then potentially even um, making them aware of the full concierge option. Uh, is there anything you think that? advisors haven't taken advantage of, you know, of what you guys provide or all the tools you give them just yet that they could dig even further on that you're like, oh, that feels like a gem that more advisors could be doing that you've got currently partnering with you? Within, um, I'd probably highlight our information library, which is which is within the, um, within the, the website, the digital mm-hmm. tool. Uh, so this information library is in addition to the roadmaps and the actions and the consultants. Uh, and it's got roughly 250 pages of deep dive information, including actually financial, a- a- aging care related financial information. So uh, home care packages, there's four levels and here's roughly how much money you can expect, for example. And so yeah. advisors, uh, if they're curious, can dive down one of those rabbit holes to learn more themselves and equip themselves as to not be the aged care um, expert. Uh, but just to know a little bit more, um, mm. particularly if they choose to, say, do roadmaps with clients together virtually or in person. Um, so, so probably that information library is is a real sort of gem. Um, we don't promote it on the homepage, mm-hmm. and there's a reason for that. We started ho- promoting it on the homepage, and we removed it because uh, one of the problems for people when they're going through an aging care arrangement is that um, there's – Information overload. The yeah. complexity is enormous. Yeah. And so we're trying to make complex simple. And we found by promoting the information library that um, some of the users were going into the library and just getting completely overwhelmed and stopping okay. the process. So um, it's a tab uh, in the website, but we don't yeah. promote it as part of the roadmap. Um, we actually have curated links in some of the actions through to the library where it makes right. sense. But, but we've done the heavy lifting and curated those links for people. If advisors want it um, as professionals, then that library's there for them. Yeah. And I do think, um, you know, that that's the, the sort of genius for me of, of, of what, what you guys brought together is that, that journey, that curated journey you've created. Like it's that, 
like we that's what you're paying for <laughs> like that's what the client's paying for is that so you know um absolutely helping them step through that and i guess the the question or the comment i'd say is it's and i'm seeing this more in lots of parts of advice is i think advisors for some of these situations are becoming going to become more like coaches than they are advisors. It'll be facilitating the discussion with the adult kids. It'll be helping them answer the questions in the, you know, their first go at the roadmap and and talking through how they feel. Like, what does that make? Does that make sense? Or does it like it's there's going to be a lot of facilitation and coaching in these things that that um probably we're all going to have to brush up our skills on, to be honest, because it is, it's not that technical part. It's um being there as a guide or even a sidekick, you know, on this journey um, that can sort of help them along. So, you know, that is something, I guess, a bit different um, for this this sort of journey. Totally. Mm. So let's look forward a bit. Is there anything, you know, plans on 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 the horizon, anything coming up that you guys are developing or or changing or adjusting to the service and the tool? Uh, the, the piece that we're working on at the moment is – uh, more videos um, and more communication um, with our uh, customers and so users mm-hmm. as well. Uh, we we will communicate with people sort of through using the roadmap, uh, but they've asked for more video content and more engaging sort of ways uh, than what we've already got. So okay. that's definitely something we're working on. Look, when you think about it into the future, um, there's an there's a, a lot of opportunities and, and maybe we consider uh, disability care mm-hmm. advice service into the future. Not yeah. quite yet. They're two very different um, systems, mm-hmm. so we we'd have to give that consideration. Uh, but at the moment, the aging care support service is is enormous, and um, we're just trying to build um, you know build the, the the snowball of how we help Australians uh, through. Uh, financial advisors, hopefully. I would say that um, there was uh, – so, so when you think about the big macro trend, I guess, the federal government uh, – well, sorry, the, the Aged Care Royal Commission called out that really for the aged care system, uh, they need to focus on three key areas. One is quality and safety for mm-hmm. the resident, um, the, the, the person using it. Yeah. Secondly is workforce. And uh, the government and the industry has started to tackle those two. Uh, mm-hmm. And most recently with the um, Fair Work Tribunal um, and the government funding 15% pay rise for yeah. aged care workers. The one that nobody has really wanted to tackle is how to fund the system uh, because it is underfunded. Yeah. And significantly four days ago, um, so on the um, 28th of May, the government released a draft strategy paper called the National Care and Support Economy Strategy. And within there, they've called out four key areas of our society that uh, they're, I guess, creating a national debate around how do we fund these. And these four areas are aged care, disability care, child care, and veterans support. Okay. So- the government is acknowledging here that there are so many people impacted in these areas. Uh, they are costing uh, the budget allocation so much, uh, but they've actually, even that funding today from the government is not enough to keep the system working well. Yeah. So they're acknowledging, um, I guess, in a, in a way that's not too confronting, that we as a society have to solve for this funding crisis. The only way that they're going to be funded more is with individuals paying more. Yeah. The government can't keep taxing, and we know that they can't um, keep increasing allocations to these areas as well as defence, as well as debt on you know interest on debt, so mm. on and so forth. So people, our clients, are going to have to pay more into the future for ageing care, uh, disability care, uh, childcare, depending on what, what they're touched by. And- Rather than if they're not taxed more, how do they pay for that? And mm. uh, so this is so an advisor is likely to have more of a role in this respect into the future as well. We don't know what the new model will be, and it could it could be that the primary home asset um, is is brought more into the asset test, yep. or it could be that unused superannuation is used more for aging care. 
Yep. Whatever the model is, I really think there's a great opportunity coming up for advisors to help clients um, because they're going to have to pay more, guaranteed. Yeah. yeah. And and because it's not something that any – and I'm not talking about advisors think about. I mean the individual thinks thinks about because it's off – even if it's only really 10 years off or five years off, it's, it's way off, right? <laughs> it's, I think it's way off. Um, then – the financial decisions they're making are ignoring that factor. Yeah. And and that's part of when you talk about funding, as you were saying that, I'm thinking, well, a bit like superannuation and and you know the uh SGC and and all these sort of things that were put in place, um, that was funding. That was funding for retirement. And it what they were doing was forcing us to think about it earlier. Now they they made it much earlier because it's all part of it as soon as you start working. But it was a mechanism that meant there was an awareness of that need. Um, and if you compared 40 years ago to now a conversation with somebody in their 30s about retirement, I mean, I'm betting that 40 years ago, somebody in their 30 wouldn't even have, a, have that conversation. Like it just wouldn't necessarily have even been on the radar. Whereas through these sort of debates and then putting in place mechanisms, it becomes something that then people are aware they're going to have to think about. So, so I'd imagine that's part of this too is, okay, that's great, but there could be a decision now about downsizing or like all sorts of things could play into that future thing that you're going to need to fund. Yep. Um, yeah. So I'm with you in terms of advisors educating themselves on, on that factor um, so that we can either assist or and I guess assist, yes, with the advice, but also facilitating the conversations early enough <laughs> so that yep. people can be more ready for this. Um, and and it's not, I guess, the, the hard thing is it 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 can sound a bit like doomsday prepping. Like it's it's oh, you're talking about the worst thing happening. It's like no, actually, we're talking about the best thing, as in longevity. <laughs> That's exactly actually what we're talking about here. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, you know, and it's generations past didn't have that longevity. No, fantastic. You know, we've got that thirty-five year aging journey. Let's make yep. the most of it. Correct, correct. Yeah, it's super easy to make money last when it doesn't have to last long, right? That's not the hard task. <laughs> it's the it's the long term that's much much tougher. Is there anything else um, that we've missed in terms of the service or or what you guys do when you partner with advisors? No, I think uh, I think that's a great start. Um, we're looking forward to uh, advisor ideas, you know. Uh, everyone's got a different approach and, and different ideas and, and that's how opportunities evolve. So, you know, we've we've definitely got something that's unique and innovative with Care and Living with Mercer and um, we're encouraging advisors to, to start to think a bit differently in this space, but we're also learning from advisors' ideas as well. So, just looking forward to more and more conversations and, and preparing for that impact across our society. Perfect. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Care and Living with Mercer, then the website link is in the episode show notes along with Will's LinkedIn details. And I'm sure he wouldn't mind if you just nudge him on LinkedIn. He'll point you to the member of the team that can follow up and have that first conversation about how your practice may engage with them. Thank you so much for joining us um, on the show today. And Caring. I mean, that's sort of, and I love that that's in the name, but caring enough that we can, you know, you can pull together a service that will help us help them, you know, which is um, ultimately how we can sort of lift up more Australians going through that retirement journey. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Peter. I've really enjoyed it. So are you a current partner of Care and Living with Mercer? Um, I'm betting probably not. Most listeners, I think, won't have necessarily embarked on this journey just yet. It is sort of um, only uh, utilised in a small a space in financial advice currently. Um, but I know that I definitely would love to hear your experience and what you found worked for you, um, You know how you managed to really elevate the experience for your clients. So please head over to the Ensemble uh, community platform um, as we'd all love to hear your take, You know suggestions, alternatives, any ideas you have. As for my thoughts on this, um, I think this is a good example of you know, solutions that we can discover when we really get to the bottom of what is keeping our clients up at night. And, you know, we can ask that question with a lot of loading 
um, you know, and what worries you about money or, you know, we, we always sort of anchor it back to money. Whereas I think if you can um, ask that question, have those conversations, do a bit almost of market research of your client base, whichever it is, whatever group it is, whatever demographic, where, whatever location, and really understand what what big challenges are you facing right now? What are you, you know, what is keeping you up at night? What's driving you nuts? What's taking you off? You know, if you focus away, then there will be a lot of demographics that this issue is a challenge for. And it won't just be those of us with um, clients over 65, over 70, you know, over 80. It's going to be 40-year-olds challenge, you know, facing this. It's going to be 30-year-olds facing it for their grandparents potentially. So understanding what's really worrying them and then thinking about, you know, partnerships we can make, um, content we can get, um, tools we can we can put in front of them to assist with that, even if it isn't necessarily financial advice. It's just helping them in their journey, right? We're just helping them deal with the moment in front of them um, and provide resources that might make that just that little bit easier. Uh, I think there'll be more and more of these types of things for different parts of life. But, um, you know, I've actually chatted to an advisor who, when doing that digging in their client base, um, discovered a lot of them were in the throes of, they were much younger, they were in the throes of of considering um, whether they, you know, there's a pay rise they should be getting and how do I even bring it up with an employer and, and how does that conversation go and what should I do and what's reasonable. And so, you know, working with somebody who could come up with some scripts for them, who could, you know, running a webinar to help them talk through how you bring that up and, and what to say, you know, what to respond with when your boss says this, that sort of stuff. So is it, technically in the financial advice category, no, but it is definitely going to hit their finances, isn't it? It's, you know, they managed to negotiate a pay rise, and then there's sort of interesting things you could assist them with there to make sure they optimize the value of that. Um, but it comes from a place of taking our um what we can do for them specifically out of the picture and just go, hey, what's bothering you? You know, <laughs> like what's the thing that you're like, right? So um, I know we're doing that for um, our practice and and the people we want to serve. Uh, and I'd love to hear your stories of what you've discovered, what surprised you um, and what you ended up trying to find a solution for so that you could put that in front of your clients. Now, as you know, there's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, superheroes really, and that's avid curiosity. And so to help you build that habit, today's Curiosity Corner app that I wanted to take you to take a look at is called StreamYard. You can find it at StreamYard.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-Y-A-R-D.com. Now, at first look, and certainly, you know, the labeling on the packaging, uh, this is a tool you can use for live streaming video to multiple social media platforms whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, all sorts of places, you doing one live video session can be pushed out to all of those places live. This could be you presenting on a topic. It could be interviewing someone or more more than one someone's hosting a panel. It can be all sorts of things that can be live streamed to all those platforms. And once set up with your accounts and, and everything set up properly, then StreamYard, as you're doing that live video, then it feeds back the comments and questions during the live stream into their tools. So you can see them as they pop up. You don't need to be trying to monitor all those different places online. It comes through, the comments are there. Um, and in fact, if there's a comment you think or a question that's really great, you can even have that pop up on screen into the video itself, which is fantastic. Like all those things are great, but you're like, Peter, I, I'm not live streaming. You can't be serious. Like that's that's way down uh, the list of things that um, you know I've got to get done. What's interesting is what actually got my attention, and I've I've been using it actually for a, a number of years now. Is the level of branding and design they let you add to the stream, so you can have a background image, whether it's a funky graphic or it's a photo or whatever it is behind you, so that fills the screen, and then you know the talking heads are sort of 
you know, further in as part of that, that it, you know, as, as boxes within that. Um, it, you can have the color of the banner pop ups, the color of the name that appears below the person talking. Um, all of this can be designed as, a, you know, a branding exercise. And so for me, what it meant was I now use the tool. I've got, you know, different, different versions of videos I, pro, you know, pull together, pre-recorded videos, these are, that I want to look a certain way. So I've got those set up as sort of templates in the tool and I can record videos that then don't need any editing once I'm done. So I can just then download and post it because it all looks good, right? It's just all formatted the way you might do post recording a video, often people will then load it up into something and give it an outline and give it again in the pop-ups and the, you know, all that sort of stuff. So this is all done in the tool. So I just, you know, to me, that's another um, point of friction or barrier that's just been dropped away. Um, they've also actually added a webinar function, um, which, I mean, we can do webinars anywhere. This is just a good looking one, right? Because all of those functions I just described and the branding and the looking good, uh, you can do in the webinar. So if somebody asks a question during a webinar, then of course people can see that, you know, attendees can see that in the pop-up, but you can actually select that question and have it pop up as a banner on the screen. So if people watch this later, they'll also get to see that question and then you can talk to it, um, which I think is really powerful. So for a really inexpensive tool, to be honest, um, it can do a lot of the heavy lifting to make your recorded videos, your live videos, your webinars look and feel really great. Um, and so check it out. And I'd love to hear whether you've actually used the tool and how you found it. Welp. That's all we've got for this week, folks. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you're, you know, middle of the year, you're stuck in a bit of a rut in terms of the processes and tech projects for the practice, maybe you want to take a bit of a step back, do some planning for the next 12 or 18 months, um, then I would love to facilitate a brainstorming session for you and the team, drawing out the next best projects for the business, what tech might assist, how you can all work together and keep on innovating as, as a habit in the practice. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn or on the Ensemble platform. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn at Peter MD, P E I T A M D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious.